You're listening to the Assembly Call IU podcast and postgame show. The place where Indiana fans across the globe hang out online after every IU basketball game. Join us for our live broadcasts on Thursday nights and immediately following every IU game at our website, assemblycall.com. That's assemblycall.com. Before we get to this week's edition of Banner Monday, let's talk real quick about tickets. You know, getting tickets online can be far too complicated. There are hundreds of sites and varying levels of reliability, and that makes it hard to know who to trust. And that is why SeatGeek is the way to go. SeatGeek pulls millions of tickets into one place so you can easily find the seats you want for the price you're willing to pay. There's nothing quite like being there in person, and SeatGeek will get you closer to the action for a great value. Now, I just checked, I just looked on SeatGeek, and there are some really, really good tickets still available for some IU games coming up, like the Marquette game coming up on Wednesday. You can get really good seats for 40 bucks. I'm looking here, 36 bucks. Like, I'm talking main concourse, you know, close to kind of center court. That's pretty good. The UT Arlington game, even better. You can get some seats for 10, 11 bucks. So if you want to go see Romeo play live, see Juwan, see Ron, Rob Finnessy, see all the guys, now's a really good time. Prices are still really, really good here early in the season. Maybe as people kind of try to feel out this team and see how good they are, uh, I would imagine that those ticket prices will go up once Big Ten play starts. Um, you know, but SeatGeek is a place to go because it's designed to make your ticket buying experience easier than ever. They search multiple ticket sites. They grade every ticket based on value. They help you identify the seat that fits your budget. And every uh, purchase is fully guaranteed. So you can shop for tickets on SeatGeek with confidence. I do. I use SeatGeek myself if I need concert tickets, sports tickets. So that's why I'm happy to recommend them to you. And best of all, listeners of the Assembly Call get $20 off your first SeatGeek purchase. So download the SeatGeek app, enter the promo code ASSEMBLY today and get $20 off your first SeatGeek purchase. SeatGeek, life's an event. We have the tickets. And now, here's this week's edition of Banner Monday. Welcome, Hoosier fans, to this week's edition of Banner Monday, where we kick off each week by doing what IU fans love more than anything else, talking hoops. IU hoops, Big Ten hoops, deep dives into basketball strategy and concepts, plus previews of IU's upcoming opponent. We do it all here every Monday, and we are happy to have you here with us. This is the fourth edition of Banner Monday, and it is our 439th episode overall of the Assembly Call, recorded on the afternoon of Monday, November 12th, 2018. I am your host, Jared Morris. And let's begin this edition of the Assembly Call, how we begin every edition of the Assembly Call, and that is with our Hoosier Proud Banner Moment. And Indiana is the national champion. When it comes down, Indiana will be champion. Martin takes the shot. Oh, oh Hoosiers have won the national championship. This week's banner moment occurred on Friday evening when the buzzer sounded on Indiana's victory over Montana State with the visiting Bobcats totaling just 35 points on the scoreboard. And while the defense was far from perfect, there were some lapses and some openings that a more skilled opponent would have taken easy advantage of, the bottom line is that Friday night was yet another step in the direction of this Indiana program forging an identity built on defense. You'll recall that Archie Miller exited Indiana's 49-point victory over Chicago State in which Indiana gave up just 55 points, visibly perturbed about the defense. He called his team out publicly, surely had a few more choice words for them privately, and then his team responded the next time out with a historic defensive performance. We can nitpick the warts and lapses all we want, but it's been more than 45 years since IU held an opponent to fewer points than Montana State's 35. That's impressive, and it's an important early season sign of a coach and his team being on the same page. That bodes well for this group's continued growth and development moving forward. All right. Now, currently, I am without a Uh, (laughs) co-host, as Ryan is not here. uh, So he usually joins me um, for the mailbag, for the Banner Monday mailbag, but he is not here uh, with us today. So I'm not 
something might have come up, he might uh, he might pop on with us here a little bit later. But I will be happy to answer some questions, go through this mailbag. So we will start out there. Uh, we also have our Big Ten Roundup coming up with Mike DeCourcy. We have Basketball 201 with Ben Ladner coming up after that, where we're going to talk about the pack line a little bit more um, in terms of three-point defense, and then also talk about Indiana's zone offense against Montana State. And then we have our opponent preview with Josh Wilson uh, from the Inside Out podcast, who will break down Marquette for us. So all of that coming here on Banner Monday. And let's start out. Let's just get to a question real quick. I'll tell you about SeatGeek here in a minute. Um, but let, let's, let's get to some of these questions. So we've got a question here from Jeff. He says, who do you think is the leading candidate for breakout player or sixth man on this very deep roster? So, you know, this is the kind of question that we got a lot in the offseason. I suppose it's interesting to revisit now that we've been able to see a couple of games, although I continue to think that we need to not overreact to what we've seen. You know, continue to remember, I think Montana State right now is ranked 299th in Ken Palm. Uh, Chicago State, you know, down in the 240s, somewhere in there in Ken Palm. So these are not good teams. We're going to learn a lot more about Indiana this week against Marquette and Arkansas. With that said, you know, we've at least been able to see some live action. So I think, you know, what Romeo's done, we expected. We know what to expect from Juwan. Justin was such a common answer to this question in the offseason that I don't want to go there, although I will say that I was very, very impressed with his play against Montana State. I thought he was outstanding. Um, You know, I think the breakout player so far has been Rob Finnessy. He's a guy who has been thrust into the starting lineup before anybody thought, you know, perhaps that was because of Devontae's injury or perhaps that was going to happen anyway. I suppose we don't really know that, but he's looked good and we're going to have to see him against, you know, bigger, tougher, quicker, more experienced players than what he's had to play so far. But his poise has been, you know, really good. His defense has been strong and he shot the ball very well against Montana State. So I think he would be the guy that you would look at look at as a breakout player, you know, making Indiana fans feel you know confident and good about their point guard situation for the first time in a while. Uh, so he would go in there. And then, you know, in terms of sixth man, then, I think we expected good things from Evan Fitzner, but I think he's been even better through two games than we thought. The shooting has been good. His ability to make some shots down low has been good. Although, again, hasn't really been facing the type of size and quickness that could give him more trouble. And the same thing is true on the defensive end. We've got to see him guard, you know, top 25 type players to really know what he's going to be. But just how hard he's played, the maturity that, that, that he's displayed, his ability to just kind of come right in and be a seamless fit on a new roster, that all bodes really well. So, you know, I think Robert and... Evan were two guys that we were expecting a lot from, but it's nice to see them be able to go out there and do it and to even play better through two games than you would have expected. You know, and I'll tell you another guy that's just interesting to keep an eye on. I'm not saying that we need to adjust our preseason expectations for him or that he's going to become a big part of this rotation, but I have liked what I've seen so far from Clifton Moore. Uh, you know, obviously he's just bigger, you know, in terms of stature. Uh, He's always kind of looked the part, but he even looks the part more now. He just, he seems more comfortable out there on the court. His movements seem a little bit more fluid. It's like he's thinking less and just kind of reacting to the moment a little bit more, you know, had a nice little hook shot. So he's showing some things. Now, again, a guy like him, we've got to see it, you know, when the game speed up and the talent gets a little bit better, but I'm not sure he really could have done more with the minutes that he's gotten. And what it shows is just the difference in overall roster depth. You know, now Clifton Moore is a guy at the end of the bench that, you know, kind of gets in if the, you know, if the game is a laughable result. And that's a big improvement over your Tim Prillers and your Jeremiah Aprils and other guys that didn't really have a place on a, you know, on a Big Ten roster. That's not Clifton Moore. He clearly has a place, has a lot of potential, is still a guy that I think you know could do some things in this program. And so it's been nice to see him step up uh, and 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 play well. You know whether it leads to him being a breakout or anything like that, I don't know. But I just thought this question was a good place to mention Clifton, just kind of give him some kudos uh, for playing better here with the minutes that he has gotten. All right, before we hop into the next question, I do just want to remind you real quick about the best way to shop online for great deals on IU basketball and football tickets. Remember the URL, iutickets.shop. It will take you right to SeatGeek, where you can immediately find the best deals on IU basketball tickets, other sports tickets, concert tickets, and more. And as a bonus, you can use the promo code ASSEMBLY to get $20 off your first purchase. 
And when you use that URL, iutickets.shop, we actually get paid a commission for referring you, so it's a great way to support the show. Uh, you know, I just went and looked at the IU listing. There are some really, really good seats available for Marquette, for UT Arlington, for UC Davis, some of these games coming up, and really reasonable prices. I mean, you can get main concourse seats for Marquette, you know, pretty much center, you know, center court for 40, 50 bucks. So if you want to get in there, see a really good game, see Romeo live. Uh, you know, see all the rest of the guys. There are really some good options on SeatGeek right now. So when you do that, uh, use the SeatGeek app, or you can use the URL iutickets.shop, and it will take you right there to the IU listings page on SeatGeek. Thank you. Okay, so let's move on here uh, with this mailbag. We got this question from Scott. He says, knowing how conservative Archie is with managing player fouls, did you notice he put Finnessy back into the Chicago State game in the first half after picking up two fouls? I did notice that. Uh, do you think this has more to do with his trust in Robert Finnessy as a true freshman? Philosophy change, the opponent, or a combination of all of the above? Um, probably all of the above. You know, I think Archie has a pretty extensive track record of being a guy who likes to sit players that get two fouls. That is his you know, philosophy. Um, and, you know, so in a game like that, let's remember, you know, Rob got the two fouls really early in the first half. And even Archie, when a guy has gotten two fouls really, really early, will sometimes put that guy back in because obviously you run the risk. If a guy gets two fouls in the first five minutes and he doesn't play at all the rest of the half, you know, what you might gain in that extra time where he doesn't pick up the third foul, you might lose in him just losing the rhythm of the game and getting out of sync and his muscles getting cold just sitting over there on the sidelines. So, you know, it sometimes is a little bit different when that guy gets the first couple of fouls in the first five minutes as opposed to if maybe the second foul comes at like the 11-minute mark or something like that. So I think that probably had something to do with it. It certainly might have been an opportunity to see how Rob would react to that situation when he gets put back into the game in a low-pressure situation. Because, you know, if he comes right back in and picks up three fouls and fouls out of the game, you're still going to beat Chicago State by 40 points. So, you know, low-pressure situation, give him an opportunity. You know, he is a guy who is showing that he's a tough physical defender, even from the point guard position. So he needs those reps, you know, learning how to still play good defense uh, without being able to foul. And, you know, it would be interesting to see now that we have a little bit more depth. And really, I guess that could go one of two ways. You know, you could think, well... You know, if Rob get, you know, let's leave Rob out there. And if he gets in foul trouble, you know, we've got Devontae, we've got Al, we've got other guys. So on the one hand, it could make Archie more liberal in playing a guy with more fouls. Or you can say, okay, he's got these two fouls. Let's sit him down because we know Al can take care of this. And let's just make sure no one gets in bigger foul trouble. Like, you know, either way, given Archie's history, it would seem to suggest that he would go the more conservative route. Um, but I think in a situation like that, you had a couple things playing into it uh, that probably led to him wanting to get Rob back out there earlier in the first half. And it'll be interesting to see how that goes. You know, uh, Ken Palm has a cool new stat now where they track that. And you can see, you know, kind of what percentage of minutes guys that have 2,000 end up playing in the first half. So that'll be uh, interesting to follow here as we move forward and see if, uh, if Archie decides to do something different with this team that is much deeper than teams he has had in the past. Next question is from JD. Uh, what happens in the bizarro world where the timelines worked out? So Ohio State hired Archie Miller and Indiana hired Chris Holtman. Would last year have been any different? Would expectation change from now going forward? I think it's, you know, it's hard to say anything would have been different last year. I think the, you know, the two things that Ohio State had going for them last year is Chris Holtman took over and obviously had a much more successful first season than Archie in terms of wins and losses were system continuity and Kata Bates Diop, you know, coming back, a five star guy that ended up being Big Ten player of the year. You know, if you, you know, if you had, if Archie had gone to Ohio State, he would have been playing a different system. So Ohio State would have, would have had to adjust to the new system. So maybe they wouldn't have hit the ground running quite in the same way that the Buckeyes did under Chris Holtman, but he would have had K to Bate to Diop. And so I think he would have been in better shape. You know, the Indiana roster that he inherited didn't, it certainly didn't have that at the beginning of the year. You know, it took Juwan Morgan a little while to become Juwan Morgan. And even Juwan, as good as he was last year, probably wasn't as impactful uh, as Cato was. And then, you know, the rest of Indiana's roster didn't quite have the talent uh, that, that Ohio State's did. And you had, again, the, you know, switching system. So, you know, I think it might have been um, a little bit different, but not a ton. And in terms of expectations now going forward, I don't think the expectations would be any different. I mean, I think Fred Glass kind of laid out the expectations before Archie was hired. And so whoever came into Indiana was going to have those expectations. And Chris Holtman is 
clearly recruiting well, doing a really good job. There's, you know, would he have been able to get Romeo? I don't know. Would he already have Trace Jackson Davis and Keon Brooks locked up? We have no way of knowing. But I think those would be the same expectations. And I think Chris and Archie are both really good coaches. I think they both would have fit at Indiana or Ohio State. And what's great about that is that I think Indiana Ohio State is one of the most underrated rivalries in in the Big Ten, really nationally, because when it's going well and Indiana Ohio State are both really good, it is intense. It's a great rivalry. It's a rivalry on the recruiting trail. It's you know good basketball games. I Man, I remember you know growing up in the early '90s, those were some epic games. You know Jimmy Jackson and Treg Lee and Jamie Skelton and all those guys, and I'm I'm forgetting some of them. Ricky Dudley played basketball for a little while. Um, you know, those were some great games. And so I'm really looking forward to that being a rivalry moving forward um, between those two. It'll be fun. Mark says, I'm going to circle back to a question that I asked you and Alex. Uh, it's Alex Bozich, my co-host on Podcast on the Brink, earlier this recruiting season. Did Archie pivot too quickly to only focusing on five-star kids and box IU into an all-or-nothing situation? Should we have prioritized a Justin Smith, Race Thompson, or Jerome Hunter type player to assure we did not have a fairly empty class? So to that, I would say we did prioritize a Justin Smith race Tom. Well, look, we, we have Armand Franklin, who I think is going to be a really good player. Maybe he doesn't, I, you know, I get what the question is saying. Justin Smith, race Thompson, Jerome Hunter were guys ranked between 50th and 80th kind of in there, like high four star type prospects. Armand Franklin doesn't profile that way. He profiles more as a low four star, high three star guy. So, <clears throat> so maybe that doesn't really fit there, but I think it was smart to prioritize an in-state guy like an Armand Franklin, make sure that you got him so that you know, you've, you've kind of got that floor, that foundation laid for the recruiting class. Now, the issue, of course, has been that you had these two incredible five-star talents, Trace Jackson Davis and Keon Brooks, that just like you did with Romeo Langford, you were going to go all in on those guys. And when you just look at the scholarship numbers, this class projects to be a smaller one. It projects to be a three-man class because Fitzner and Morgan are gone for sure. Romeo Langford almost assuredly gone for sure. And then, you know, whether you want to project another scholarship there because of, you know, the likelihood of a transfer, not that any individual is likely to transfer, just that it's college basketball and it's a pretty good bet that teams are going to have transfers. Maybe it's a four-man class. So it has been exceedingly clear that Indiana has been making Trace Jackson Davis and Keon Brooks a priority and that you're going to hold scholarships for those guys as long as you need to. That can't make it easy to go out and recruit other guys in, you know, like a Justin Smith, Race Thompson, or Jerome Hunter, who are going to be recruited by really good schools when you can't make them a priority. You know, even to get those guys, you've got to make them a priority. Now, sometimes they'll wait and see what kind of opportunities open up at maybe bigger schools, that kind of thing. But it's a little bit, <clears throat> you know, I think this question really requires the context of the situation to answer. You know, did Archie pivot too quickly to focusing on five-star kids? No, because these two five-star kids are in your backyard, and by all accounts, you're leading for Trace Jackson Davis, and by almost all accounts, it's between you and Kentucky for Keon Brooks. So you've got to wait. You've got to be patient. You've got to give those guys time. And yes, the risk of doing that is that if they end up choosing to go elsewhere, you know, you could be left in the spring with, you know, Armand Franklin and a couple of open scholarships and not the kind of options that you would like. But in this situation, when these guys are right in your backyard and you've got a good chance at getting them, you've got the long term relationship with Trace, you've got the, you know, the relationship with Keon Brooks' dad, with Ed Schilling, going back to him coaching him in college, like you've got to go all in on those guys. And so I guess all I'm saying is, you can't just expect a Justin Smith or a Jerome Hunter level recruit to say, okay, I'll wait forever to see what those guys do. That, that's just, I think, kind of the reality of the, of the recruiting game. So I think Archie and his staff made the right decision to prioritize Chase and Keon. It's a risk-reward type scenario, and I think you take the risk given the reward. And if you don't get one or both of those guys... Now you're looking to see what opens up in the spring. You're looking to see if anybody's going to transfer, either graduate or you know just kind of the normal transfer route. Um, you know, or you know you have to go with guys that might have been your C or D options, but at least you swung for the fences. And if Indiana's going to get back to hanging banners and doing the kinds of things we want Indiana to do, they're going to have to swing for fences, especially with guys in their backyard. Now, if you know if they were going, if we're talking about you know maybe Matt Hurt and Trendon Watford, and Indiana was putting all their eggs in that basket two guys that aren't in state and that you maybe didn't have as good of a, an opportunity to get, 
now maybe this is a little bit more of a discussion, but I just I really can't fault Archie for uh, for and the staff for what they chose to do here. And let's remember that just because Trace and Keon are waiting a little bit, it doesn't mean they're for sure committing elsewhere. <laughs> it's easy to get a little disappointed, easy to get a little bit impatient, but I think Indiana's still in a good position with both of those guys. And if one or both of them end up coming, Indiana's strategy, their thought process is going to end up being proven uh, to have been the right one. And I think either way, it, the process is what's important. And I think their process was the right one here. Uh, ben says, <clears throat> what type of role early on Excuse me, I had something in my throat. Uh, do you envision for a guy like Race Thompson, who has the potential to add significant value to the rotation, but is coming off an injury that's kept him sidelined for the first week of the season? So this question came in before the Montana State game. Uh, you know, now we've gotten to see Race play not a ton and not against the kind of competition that we want to see him play against. But, you know, my main observation about him was that he was a much more fluid athlete than I thought. I thought he ran well. I thought he moved well. Um, you know, we know he's a guy dating back to his high school days that has a good face up game. So, you know, I especially after listening to Archie talk about him, you know, being a guy who likes to mix it up and, and do those kinds of things, you know, I guess that was kind of the vision that I had formed in my head that he was just more of like a, you know, tough bruising guy down low and you know, kind of forgotten what we'd seen, you know, watching him play in high school. But that was a good reminder that this guy's a he's a decent athlete, you know, and can move around. So I think he's a guy that you could steal minutes with at the five if you need to defensively, because I think he's going to be able to play that type of defense. Um, you know, and offensively, because he can face up, he can play in lineups with Juwan Morgan and with Justin Smith, who do some of their best work around the basket. You know, Juwan still does his best work posting up. Justin Smith still does his best work, you know, working from the short corner, finding opportunities to dive to the basket, you know, get offensive rebound offense. And so you don't necessarily want a guy like Race clocking up the lane. Uh, and I think because of what he does offensively, he can do that. So I think I, I don't envision him being a starter, but I do think he's going to be a rotation player as the season plays on, especially since Deron Davis probably isn't going to be able to give you more than 10 or 15 minutes a game. Um, and, and so, you know, we're still going to have to see race play more. We have to see if his shot is reliable enough this year to be an offensive weapon. If it's not, then I think he's a guy that's going to play more spot minutes um, and will get more minutes in games where guys get in foul trouble. If he can step out there and knock down a 15 foot jump shot or even knock down three pointers, you know, now he's a guy that really, I think, figures strongly into the rotation, especially, you know, when you're playing teams like a Michigan State and you're going to need more, more guys down low. So encouraged by what I saw from him against Montana State. But now, as with all the guys, we've just got to see him play against better competition um, to, to see what his role will be uh, more clearly moving forward. All righty. Uh, thank you for being here and listening to the mailbag. Let's uh, let's move on here. Coming up on the assembly call, it is time for our Big Ten Roundup with Mike DeCourcy from BTN and the Sporting News. He will provide his impressions of Indiana's performances uh, through these first two games and discuss the rest of the Big Ten. Stick with us here on the assembly call. Welcome back to Banner Monday. Each week here in our second segment, we zoom out to take a look at how things are going across the Big Ten Conference. And there is no one better to provide insight on Big Ten basketball than Mike DeCourcy, who covers Big Ten hoops for BTN in addition to his columns for the Sporting News. Mike, welcome back to Banner Monday. It's great to be here, Jared. You and I were just talking about how the Sagarin ratings came out, and uh, Indiana was ranked ninth, which was nice to see in Nebraska, number one over Duke in the early season Sagarin ratings, which is a, a great boon to the Big Ten's reputation here early in the season. <laughs> uh, the best part, the best part about that was uh, Tim Miles tweeting out, "Finally, there's a computer that gets us." Uh, Tim is Tim is priceless. He is so much fun, and so when they're good, uh, he has he has a lot of fun with it. it it's the game is supposed to be fun, and and he is a, a clever guy with a great sense of humor, and I think the Huskers the Huskers have done well in the in the opening week. Uh, I think they need to expand their uh, sphere of influence. I, I don't know. Uh, they don't need to have more players. They need to have more players playing well. They've got four guys that are playing off the charts. Is it, that's no surprise, but you know that fifth, sixth, seventh spot has to solidify uh, for them to be a, an outstanding team. Well, maybe let's start there. Instead of starting with IU, let's start with the Big Ten. Um, you know, a few weeks back, you gave us your kind of power rankings, your top four heading into the season. What are your current uh, Big Ten top four power rankings, and has anything changed since the preseason based on what we've seen so far? 
I don't think there's anything, any reason to change based on the first week. Uh, they've all won uh, Michigan, Michigan State, Wisconsin, Nebraska. They've all won. And so it's hard to say. I think that, that I, I would have very little surprise if they changed significantly by the end of the week uh, because Michigan's got to go to Villanova. That's going to be a very difficult game for them. Uh, this is not the same Villanova team that, that beat them in the championship game, but it's not the same Michigan team either. So we'll see what happens there. Uh, and then you have Wisconsin going to Xavier on Monday night, uh, and that's a difficult game. So uh, some challenges for those teams. And Indiana has been terrific right now and 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 as as promising as you would want them to be. I mean, they've done everything in public that you would want them to do. It's just that it hasn't been against the, the greatest opposition. As it, that I'm not saying that the other four beat great teams either. Uh, but uh, actually, I, 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 I am incorrect. Michigan State did lose. Uh, we all saw that in the Champions yeah. Classic. Um, but they played really well in the second half, and, and after really struggling early, they got it together. So I, I'm not going to move them off that line because they lost to one of the two, three best teams in the country. Uh, if, they were, if they were expected to be one of the two or three best teams or if they had been the one overall on my ranking uh, when we first talked, I might move them. But uh, I think they're still pretty much in the same place as where they were before they lost that game. Oh, would Indiana be right about fifth? In your... Oh, easy. Okay. I mean, they'd be 4A. Be, I mean, yeah. the three, four, five to me has always been, uh, the, among those three, really close. And 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 those three have not been that far removed from one and two. I, I think those five teams are the ones with the most potential in the league. And it wouldn't surprise me if any one of them won the conference. And again, you know, my my concern about Indiana going into the year was one position. And, and and because it's the most important position, that's why I had them at five. If they had that position covered and then maybe a uh who's gonna be the wing, who's gonna be I wouldn't be I wouldn't have uh, been as concerned and, and maybe would have had them closer to, to two or three. Well, what's interesting about that, you, know, you talk about that position, the point guard position, what I'm assuming that you're that you're referring to. And, you know, one of the biggest storylines coming out of the Chicago State game and the Montana State game has been the play of Rob Finnessy, Indiana's freshman point guard who started, you know, now we don't know if he started because Devontae was hurt or if that's what was going to happen anyway in game right. one. Um, but what have been your your early impressions of Rob Finnessy so far? I've liked him. Uh, He's been very solid and making the right play, making the play, not not trying to do anything too difficult. And that's see, that's what you need from that position on this team. I mean, you don't need a guy to make difficult plays. You've got two guys who can make difficult plays, maybe three. If Smith is, you know, maybe just turns it up a little bit more. I mean, you've got two guys who are really skilled, high level basketball players, two of the best in the Big Ten. So you don't need that point guard to do difficult things, and let you know situationally maybe you you might say you know uh, you might have Jawan off and and you might have uh, the other guys uh, not playing well and you might need the point guard to turn things up. But as this team's constructed, this point guard needs to not turn over the basketball, make open shots, and get the ball uh, to where it, it to where the playmakers are. And and I think that. You know, Rob showed in the first two games a great ability to do that. Devontae, uh, lesser extent, he turned the ball over a little bit too much, especially given the opposition, and, you know, didn't make shots at the level you'd want. You know, maybe tried a few too too many difficult shots. Again, you don't need that from this position. It, 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 there might be some games uh, when Romeo's not playing well and Jawan's not playing well that you might want Devontae to try to amp things up a little bit. But... Overall, holding that position down, whoever ends up in that spot, the, the, the things that I mentioned are all the first items for that position. And, and I, should, I left out one, which is you got to guard your man, too. And, and that's where Devontae has an edge you know, going into this uh, season over Rob. And that's where both or either and all of their teammates will be tested on Wednesday night. What, well, let's talk about Wednesday night. Marquette's coming in. We know they have an elite offense, and they have I mean, one of the best players in the country, certainly one of the best shooters, and Marcus Howard. What are the keys uh, for Indiana to win this game against Marquette? Well, I think the first thing is you have to defend the perimeter generally. Uh, they are an elite three-point shooting team. Now, at, to this point, uh, Sam Hauser and Marcus Howard have been the ones who've taken uh, almost all of their three-point shots. 
but they have other guys who have who are are, are threats. Joey Hauser can make shots. Uh, they those guys uh, they they have two or three other guys who have shot forty percent or so to this point, but on very low attempts. So, but it just they, they it's there. There's those guys that you know if you spend all your attention on Sam Hauser and Marcus Howard. Uh, and then you let the other guys open as a result of that. They have guys who can stick you. So you've got to defend the perimeter generally really well. And then, you, you know, secondarily, you have to contain Marcus Howard. I mean, he had seven in his college career. He's had seven 30 plus point games, one last week, and a 50 pointer, and they included in that collection, a 52 pointer a year ago. I mean, he can absolutely go off. And so, Whoever is checking him, and that's you know, it's going to be an interesting matchup for for uh, for for Indiana. Whether you know, do they try to go big on him? Do they try to just stick with the conventional matchup of whoever is point guard, whether it's Devonte or Robert or somebody else? Do you do you stick with that? Um, that will be interesting. I, I, I still remember this, and this is one of the reasons why. What you you know, I, I'm not opposed to going bigger on him, but. Um, I think it's better to do that as a as an emergency. I remember in the 2006 NCAA championship game when um, Torian Green was playing point guard for Florida, and they had better players at every other position, but Torian was the whole key. If you shut him down, Florida was in trouble because they didn't have another way to get going. And and Cedric Bozeman for UCLA, great defensive player, one of the best defensive players in the country, and Ben Howland built his entire game plan around Cedric Bozeman taking out Torian Green. And three trips down, Green went bang, bang, bang. I think it was two threes and a two that maybe got to the lane. I can't remember exactly. But he just wrecked Ben Howland's whole day and a half worth of work, and UCLA had no chance after that. So better to keep that in reserve to go bigger in that matchup uh, and you know start the game trying out whoever you believe is the right point guard for that game Start the game trying out with him guarding him, and then if you need to, move on from there. Yeah, I, I kind of feel the same way. I mean, I was just looking at their roster, and because yeah, I was thinking, okay, maybe you put a Romeo or a Zach McRoberts on him to bother him with length, but then you look at the rest of their roster; it's six five, six five. So that's you know six seven. I mean, that's the other reason is they've got some size that if you do that, now you're going to have to guard somebody else with a Rob or a Devonte and give up some size there. So it will it will be interesting to see what they do there. It kind of strikes me when you look at the profile of this team, it's kind of like seeing an Archie Miller Indiana team play an old Tom Crean Indiana team. <laughs> you know, the way that the way that they can shoot and kind of space the floor. Are they defending any better? Because I know that was a big problem for them last year. Well, they have to this point, but again, that some of that comes from level of opposition. I mean, I went back when Iowa uh, started their season off with a good defensive effort, 37% by their first opponent. And so well, that, that's a good start. But then I look back a year ago and their first couple of opponents were shooting in the thirties because of who they were. So yeah. I think it's too early. I think Wednesday night we find out, are they defending better? Because they've got to deal with Romeo and they've got to deal with Juwan and they've got to deal with Smith and they've got to deal with a lot of guys who can make baskets. And, and Devante is a guy who can create his own shot. He's just got to do a little better job of it than he has in the first two games. And so they, that, then we'll know. Uh, whether they can defend better, uh, Deron Davis, if he can get in there and get inside and get and get some touches in the post, it's nice to see him back last week. Yeah. Um, and so that that the Indiana has a lot of different ways, a lot of different guys that can score. And you know, that's one of the things that uh, off the first two games that I'd like to see Jawan a little bit more actively involved in the offense. Again, I think that's probably situational. He didn't have to play as many minutes. He didn't have to do as much. But I want you know when they start to play real teams, and that starts on Wednesday. You want to see him become more involved in the offense because of what he can present. So, looking around the conference, what players and teams around the conference this past week caught your eye? Well, I'd say the first team that caught my eye was Rutgers. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, um, Eugene Omiyori uh, playing terrifically, averaging 19 points a game. Rutgers has six guys averaging in double figures. So that's you know, again. It's all early, and it's not great opposition for anybody. I mean, they were you know, Drexel and Fairly Dickinson, um, you know, the kind of teams that you would expect to beat. However, those, you know, having having Omiyori step forward into some pretty big vacancies, uh, 
the Rutgers lost, you know, they, they were not an elite team by any stretch a year ago. And then they lose, you know, multiple highly contributing players. So they needed some guys to step forward. And we all know Geo Baker I mean, it started his first game as a freshman, basically. So we know, we know about him and we know he'll be a good player. Um, but for Omiyori to play as well as he has and for them to have six guys averaging in double figures, I think was a real step forward. Um, the other team I thought played pretty well uh, was Purdue. And I, one of the reasons for that is because Purdue had to fight. Uh, Ball State, a, a pretty good MAC team, um, you know, one that I don't know that they're on Buffalo's level, but it's, it's a good, solid MAC team that will contend for the first division in that, in that league. Uh, they, they, they had to struggle to beat them, but they did. And they, and they pulled away late. Matt Harms played well, uh, is, is playing well on offense. Uh, and then of Carson Edwards. Now, I mean, as I said earlier uh, in one of our earlier discussions, I mean, they were dumping the whole truckload of responsibility onto Carson Edwards and how would he handle it. And to date, he's been outstanding. I mean, 26 and a half points in, 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 in average over the two games, uh, has shot the basketball pretty well. Uh, not not necessarily, uh, sh- did not shoot the ball well against Ball State from three-point range, but is but still managed. Even, I think, I think he went two of 10 from three and still managed to go like 12 or 22. So, I mean, he was making almost everything he took from two-point range. So I, I, I like where they started out. But you know, I think uh, over these next two weeks, uh, three weeks really, when you count the start of the conference play, you've got a lot of teams involved in, in, in uh, the multi-team tournaments. And then you've got the uh, ACC Big Ten Challenge. And then you've got the start of league play. And we will know more about the Big Ten and its hierarchy by the first week of December than probably any other conference will know about their leagues. Well, when it comes to that Purdue win, you never take for granted those wins against in- in-state schools because they can, as, <laughs> as, as we learned last year, not, not they, me. Yeah, they, they, can, they can come get you. So that's, you know, you look at that score, you might not think a lot of it, but I guarantee you all Indiana fans nodded and, you know, impressed with Purdue being able to get that win like they did because that's, uh, that's not always an easy one to get. Um, so, you know, we've had a lot of games this first week where, as as we've mentioned, we don't really know what to take from them. The competition ratchets up in a big way, you know, Indiana playing Marquette and going on the road against Arkansas, two really good games. What other games around the conference should we really pay attention to, to kind of give us a sign about, you know, particular teams and how good they may or may not be? Well, for those people going to assembly hall, and I'm going to be one of them, um, the, the challenge will be how much of the Michigan Villanova game can we catch hmm. uh, I think that's really interesting you know the the two teams that played in the championship game last year an opportunity to see them rematched uh, I think that's a, a very important game uh, for the two teams I, I don't think that it's it's decisive for the conference certainly uh, because it, you know, if you lose a road game at Villanova I mean that's kind of what you're expected to do but if obviously if Michigan could get that one and I think it's going to be an interesting game because Michigan played a really strong defensive game in their second outing. And that, it, that does need to be who they are. They were not clicking on offense. I mean, uh, they went into full 1976 Pittsburgh Steelers mode on that, uh, in, in the second half of that one, uh, and, and really did well defensively and were able to turn that game around. Uh, Villanova is, uh, obviously not the challenge that they were a year ago when they had four first round picks, I think in their lineup. Uh, but it's still a great group. Uh, Phil Booth has played really well to this point. Eric Paschal has been a great player in his career. Uh, they've got some very good young players. Uh, Colin Gillespie's played well so far. Uh, didn't get a chance to play a ton last year, not because he wasn't good enough yet, but because the guy in front of him was the national player of the year. So uh, Jalen Brunson. So uh, Colin Gillespie's got a chance to show he's, he's a really capable player. He's going to have a nice career now that he's uh, able to be in the rotation. So big game there. And then I think the other game that's really interesting is St. John's. Uh, again, I believe that game's at Rutgers. St. John's plays Rutgers uh, as another Gavit Games matchup. And, I, you know, I, I St. John's came in with a lot of, you know, a lot of expectations, a lot of high hopes uh, uh, with, with some transfers and with Shamari Pons back. Uh, you know, obviously Mustafa Heron coming in from Alabama, somebody they were pretty excited about getting. Uh, but they've got, you know, Rutgers is a, a team that will play tough. Uh, uh, Steve Pico, I, I, just a terrific basketball coach and a great hire for Rutgers. And changing the culture at, at Rutgers is, is 
been a challenge because it's not so much the players that uh, you have to change, but getting guys to believe that Rutgers is a basketball school to an extent. After all the years that they have struggled as a program, uh, that's you know changing that mentality as you go out and recruit is is a real effort. So. Uh, this would be an opportunity for him to really make a statement and for the Knights to really make a statement against the, against the St. John's team that, that I think came into the year believing they could make the NCAA tournament and uh, hasn't played great to date. But uh, again, they have a chance to turn their season in the right direction uh, if they're able to beat Rutgers. Last question for you. What is your favorite part about seeing games at Simon Scott Assembly Hall? Well, I, I think that the the arena crowd is one of the best in college basketball. I I, I would put them up there with just about anybody. Um, the the atmosphere, the uh, the facility, the you know the history of Allen Fieldhouse goes back a few decades before Assembly Hall, so it has that. And it, it you know Assembly Hall it, it, as it's constructed does not have quite the same charm as Allen does because you know that old time gym field that you get if you go to Allen Fieldhouse. But when but when the, the Hoosiers play, I, I believe that's as good a home court advantage as there is in college basketball. And we've seen that because of how uh, they've either beaten or challenged teams that were that, that that were more talented over the last couple of years, for instance, last year. Um, they really put a scare into a lot of very good Big Ten teams because, at Assembly Hall because of uh, how good the crowd was. Uh, they went and beat the 2017 national champion in, in November of two, 2016 when Carolina came in. Uh, it's, a, it's a great home court advantage. And, and I do love seeing the impact that that, that that home crowd, that that enthusiasm can have on a visiting team. It's, it, it, you, you like to see when you're, when you're a writer, when you're a journalist, you want to see the things that are unusual, that are different, that are special. And I think the crowd at Assembly Hall is really special. And I'm not making that up because if I were talking, and you know, I'm doing a show in Louisville in, in tomorrow <laughs> afternoon. And if they asked me the question, best crowds, you know, I would tell them, uh, you know, that in terms of home court advantage, I would give it to Indiana over pretty much everybody. Absolutely. Follow him on Twitter at TSN Mike. Mike, we always appreciate your visits on Mondays. Thank you for your insight on the Hoosiers and the Big Ten. Thanks very much, Jared. I'll look forward to next week. Absolutely. All righty, coming up, it is time for another edition of Basketball 201 with Ben Ladner. We're going to talk a little bit more about the pack line defense defending the three-point line, plus look at how Indiana worked offensively against Montana State's zone. Stick with us here on the Assembly Call. Welcome back to Banner Monday. You know, here at the Assembly Call, we don't just want to make you a smarter IU basketball fan. We want to make you a smarter basketball fan, period. And that is the purpose of our weekly Basketball 201 segments with Ben Ladner. Ben is a senior at IU. He's our joint intern uh, between the Assembly Call and Inside the Hall. Has been doing a great job with these Basketball 201 segments. Lots and lots of positive comments every week for your work, Ben. And uh, we've got another thanks. interesting one prepared. So thanks for being here again. Yeah, absolutely. I'm happy to do it. Uh, before we hop into this, just real quick, you know, your overall impressions of Indiana so far through a couple of regular season games. Um, they've looked good, obviously. Hard to take too much away from games against Chicago State and Montana State. But I guess the two things that jump out to me is that when they move the ball, Indiana can get pretty much whatever shot they want. And a lot of that has to do with the quality of the opponent, obviously. But And, and, and I'm sure against Marquette, it, it will not be so easy as simply, you know, one pass and a dribble drive to get to the basket. But I mean, something we'll, we'll touch on in the, the episode today was just that ball movement. When they get that ball hopping around, they've got so many smart ball movers on this team. And when they really move it with purpose and, and with um, aggression without hesitation, they, they can bend the defense out of shape and get pretty much whatever shot they want. And then the second thing is transitioning defense to offense. This has been a, a point of emphasis for Archie Miller, for the players for pretty much everyone all season long is, is they really want their defense to fuel their offense. It's not going to be a team that shoots a lot of threes. It, it's not going to be a team that just jacks up a bunch of jump shots all the time. 
they want to get to the basket. They want to get to the foul line. Uh, they want layups and dunks. And one of the best ways to do that is to score in transition. And one of the best ways to do that is to force a lot of turnovers with ball pressure and, and, you know, using your length to get in passing lanes and, and running out, getting points on the fast break. And so through two games, they've done a really nice job of that. They've got a really, a lot of really, really long defenders and, and athletic guys on this team. And so they get a bunch of runouts. They get a bunch of kind of semi transition, good looks to the basket, a lot of basket cuts. So those are the two things that have really stuck out to me so far. So we got last week in the basketball two one segment, we talked about the pack line defense mm-hmm. and we got a question from James. That I think is really interesting. So I'm going to read it. It's kind of a long question, but I feel like the entire question actually makes a pretty good point. So let's read this and let's talk a little bit about this. Obviously how Indiana defends the, th- the three point line is going to be really important against Marquette. And he brings up a few good points. So James says, I feel like one point still being missed in the is the pack line weak against the three discussion. How many consistently successful teams in college basketball have elite three point shooting without generating open three pointers first by drives to the basket or good passes to the paint? He says, I feel like this point was brought up by Galen last year when IU was giving up a ton of threes and people were complaining about the pack line. But a lot of those good shots were generated by really good ball movement and drives to the basket before the shot that the pack line should prevent if it is executed properly says, you know, we mentioned this in the segment about pick and roll defense, but sometimes holes in the defense evolve so much over the course of the play and fans only fixate on the last shot or player. Uh, You know, a lot of NBA teams like the Rockets generate open shots by James Harden driving and kicking aside from stupidly good shooters like Steph Curry. And I suppose maybe Marcus Howard qualifies as a stupid, stupidly good shooter, maybe not to Steph's level. But, you know, aside from those guys literally bringing the ball up and occasionally jacking and making long threes. How much is the pack line at a disadvantage versus other defenses? The 2011-12 Hoosiers had truly great shooters, but they didn't get the open looks they really needed until Cody showed up to put, uh, uh, you know, to pull defensive pressure, and Vic could really glide to the hole, and obviously Yogi then, you know, penetrating and kicking as well. Um, So he wants to know if he's missing something. What do you think about what James said here, Ben? I think all of that is is true to some extent. The the thing I would push back, or not push back against, but the the counter argument I would make is that. You know, you don't need three, four, five, six passes in sequence to generate a three pointer, right? Sometimes it can be if you've got, let's say, the guy has the ball up top, he beats his man off the dribble, and you know the 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 guy one pass away is sagged down, or maybe he doesn't even beat his man off the dribble, but he you know he's able to get inside the three point arc, and the guy one pass away is kind of sagging in a help position. Well, if you've got a a capable three point shooter, not not a, a you don't even need a great one. It, it can't be a bad one, but it, as a guy who can catch and shoot the ball, if you've got a decent three point shooter on that wing, that's just one pass away. It's, it's right. It's one dribble, one kick and a shot. Um, it's also vulnerable. Like we mentioned against bigs that can shoot the ball. And then that's against certain teams. Uh, you don't see this as much in college, but sometimes teams will use guards just to, to set ball screens and then have them pop to the perimeter. And when you're hedging all those ball screens, then you're like we said, you know, we've touched on this a lot. You're bringing two guys out on the ball out way out on the floor and putting your team at a momentary numbers disadvantage. And so you make that one quick swing pass and it's an easy catch and shoot three. And then if the defense closes out on you, you just make it the, the next swing to the, the next guy and he knocks down the shot. So, you know, it just uh, it, it triggers a lot of those long rotations. And I think it can lead the offense into making a lot of those long kind of um, swing sequences around the perimeter like James is talking about. But the main thing is just that the other four defenders that aren't guarding the ball are just kind of sagging off their guys. And the, and the purpose of that, obviously, is to prevent penetration into the middle. But, you know, sometimes you don't have to get the ball all the way into the heart of the defense and then kick it out. It can just be kind of that short drive and then a, a quick kick to a three. And in those situations, when you're sagging off of that shooter, it's a longer closeout. And in a lot of cases, it's a, a more open shot. It was interesting at Montana State. At least once or twice, we saw one of those cross like uh, cross court passes that got a wide open three, and of course they bricked it because they just you know right. not good enough shooters to make it. But I thought about you in our segment talking about that. Yeah. As we approach this Marquette game, what word would you use to best describe your feeling about Indiana's defense heading into this? Are you more confident, curious, or concerned about Indiana's ability to defend the three against Marquette? I'd say curious just because we haven't seen them defend at a high level against a good team yet. And that's because they haven't played a good team yet. They've defended at a really high level, like an elite level in their first two games and and three, if you count the scrimmage, they've held their opponent under like, I think it's like 0.82 points per possession in all three of the games they've played. And that's a ridiculous mark. Like that's 
that's unbelievable. If they, if they were to sustain that for the entire season, they would have the number one defense in the country. Mm -hmm. Um, obviously they won't do that in all likelihood because they'll play better teams. Uh, you know, not every team will be as cold as Montana state was (laughs) on Friday night, but uh, you know, I think they've looked good. I, I think they're executing from at a much higher level than they were this time last year. And even than they were at the end of last year, I just think, you know, the whole defense has really taken a step up and then they're, you know, they're starting from a better point now than they were this time a year ago. I think I mentioned this in one of my, uh, you know, kind of post game notebooks from a, the Chicago state game is that I just think the starting point for this defense is so much higher than it was a year ago that they don't have as much of a leap to make on defense. And so yeah. the learning curve won't be t- quite as drastic for them. That said, against a team like Marquette with some shooters, particularly Marcus Howard, who can do it off the catch and off the dribble, that's going to be a test. And, you know, we'll, we'll see if they need to change up their defensive scheme at any point. I actually think hedging is not a bad strategy on ball screens against a guy like Marcus Howard because it stops him from just dribbling right into those pull-up threes. So, you know, I, I think they're well-equipped to handle this challenge. It's obviously a really close matchup rankings-wise. Uh, Mar- Marquette's 24-25, I think, and Indiana's just outside the top 25. So. They're about even in the rankings. I think they're probably about even in talent, um, about even in preseason expectations, et cetera, et cetera. And so this will be a a good test. Um, I'm definitely not concerned, but I I don't know that there's necessarily been a lot for me to take and say, okay, this is, you know, a a definitively good sign that will carry over through the entire season. So really, this is their first chance to prove themselves, I think. All right. Well, let's switch gears. Let's talk offense. Um, You've got some videos prepared talking about how Indiana attacked Montana State. So let's let's go. So through this. Montana State played a two three zone for much of the game on Friday. They they switched up to a man to man at certain portions of the game, but mostly they 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 came out in a two three and stayed that way for a lot of the game. Um, here we have a clip. This is the first play of the game. Indiana wins the tip. Bring the ball up with Robert Finnessy. We'll set the floor. We've got Romeo Langford. You're kind of at the top. Juan or Romeo Langford. Sorry, is down here. This is Justin Smith up top. Zach McRoberts on the wing. Juwan Morgan at the high post. So Finnessy brings it up, immediately recognized 2-3. They, in all likelihood, they knew that Montana State was going to come out in a 2-3. So they get into a set. Finnessy dumps it and, and comes. He's going to come back over to the weak side. And so they're, put, they're basically trying to overload. They don't get it. But what they do, they just transition to kind of a swing sequence. And you can see Indiana just patiently swinging the ball around, one man to the next. And then finally, you get that skip pass. And when Finnessy skips it, you can see how the defenders, the, the two, the, the guy on the wing here, and then the, the elbow player are both fixated on Finnessy. They're loading up on him. This guy is, is shutting off Juwan Morgan. Top defender shading towards Langford and Justin Smith in the high post here. Finnessy notices that skip open to uh, Zach McRoberts. Good closeout for Montana State, but two guys on the ball, right? So both of these players closed out onto McRoberts. And so obviously you're going to, Indiana's going to have a numbers advantage there. And it's Justin Smith, just finding this soft spot kind of right at the free throw line. You can see number five here. I think this is Harold Frey. If he leaves Romeo Langford, this is a catch and shoot three for Romeo at the top. So instead he kind of tries to split the difference between Langford and Justin Smith. But as, as would be the case with most, most defenders, he doesn't do it well enough. Smith steps in, and just go straight to the basket and, you know, probably should get a better rotation from this guy at the bottom of the key. He should probably, he should be on the midline right now. He's, he's shaded way over toward Robert Finnessy. He's, he's way too far to the weak side of the floor here. Mm-hmm. So Justin Smith, there's no help defense because the center is shaded on Juwan Morgan, taking away his post up and Smith just steps right into that empty space and lays it up. And that was a theme all game long for Indiana. They were just able to, and Evan Fitzner does a really nice job of this as well. I might have a clip of him a little bit later, but IU just does a really good job. I thought of, of, of finding those soft spots granted against a team that didn't really execute their zone all that well and, and is not the most talented team in the world. But I was impressed with the way they were patient on offense and just able to find those weak spots. I feel like if we played against a two, three zone every game, Justin Smith would average 20 to 25 points. <laughs> Like he, one of the things that has stood out to me that even yeah. from, you know, he struggled early as, in, you know, in his freshman year last year. But one of the things that really stood out even early on is he has really good vision in the zone. 
Like yeah. he understands where to go. He understands where to cut. He's always making himself available. And you know, you saw right there. He makes himself available. He's got a wide open lane in there for the layup. But he really excels uh, in zone offense. If only we could rewind to 2013 and have Justin Smith against Syracuse. Maybe that game goes differently. But yeah, that yeah. was that was really nice. And he continues to impress. With well, and another offense. thing I'll point out here too is from that clip. You know, watch watch where Indiana's play. Once they kind of run this initial action. Look where their position, their players are positioned. You've got Justin Smith in the short corner, Jawan Morgan at the high post. And these two bigs basically move in tandem. And, and you'll see throughout the possession, they're going to, they're kind of going to trade spots here as Morgan starts out in the high post and then he kind of goes down. And right as he goes down to fill that short corner and try to get that seal, Justin Smith comes up. So they're basically, and this is something that you teach at the high school level, at the middle school, it's kind of basics of going against his own defense. But you need to have these two big guys, at least in most zone offenses, kind of moving opposite one another. So you kind of have this triangle made up of, or I guess it's more of a trapezoid, made up of the two high post spots and the two short corner spots. And these two guys basically just move from one spot to the next and kind of cycling around as the ball moves around. Each guy kind of, like, like I mentioned, picking those spots, trying to find where there might be openings in the defense. And so on this possession and in the other clips I'll show, they did a really nice job of moving in those spots and finding the weak points. You know, it, it, Indiana would seem like the kind of team that you would want to play zone against until we prove that we can consistently knock down threes. But do right. you think that because of how good Jawan and Justin and Evan and even Duran at times can be playing against a zone because of just their their IQs and their ability to pass, do you think that could keep teams from playing zone because those guys are so good? It could. Um, I, I think most teams... Most teams, if they would load up on those guys, I think, until Indiana proves right. they can hit shots at a high rate. And so, but, you know, I think in theory, you've got some good shooters on this team. And Archie Miller said this isn't really a team that aspires to shoot a lot of threes. But, you know, if they get open ones and they're catch and shoot looks and they're good shots, they're going to take them. And you have guys like Romeo Langford, Robert Finnessy, who's shown some nice touch from the three point line. I think even Justin Smith could step out and hit some shots this year. Um, Zach McRoberts has improved his jump shot. Fitzner, all guys who can kind of step out behind the line and hit shots if they're left open. And so, yeah. yeah and, and one thing in the Montana state game was that Jawan Morgan was drawing a lot of attention and he was the guy that made a lot of these plays possible, not just because of his scoring and passing, but just because of his gravity in the post. He was so dominant in the first half that Montana state had to pay a lot of attention to him. And then when he drew two defenders, there was a wide open, you know, cutting lane on the backside or something like that, and, and they were just kind of able to waltz into the lane. Yep. All right, next video. That was good stuff. So the next one, it's actually the very next possession of the game. It's uh, kind of same setup here. Robert Finnessy crosses half court. Justin Smith, McRoberts, Romeo Langford, Juwan Morgan, basically all in the same places. They're running the exact same set. They'll get McRoberts cycling through here. Romeo brings it to the top. And same kind of thing, just kind of they, they look for this kind of flare screen action, but it's not there. And so fantasy does a nice job just swinging it right back out. Romeo Langford started, started this game really looking to set guys up. I think if this is later in the game, maybe he tries to create something off the dribble here, get into the heart of the, the defense or maybe step into a three here. But because it's a minute into the game, he's just kind of taking his time, being patient, Indiana swinging it across the court. Fantasy looks for the drive. It's not there. And then... And th this is this is why you move the ball against a zone is because you get it moving. You kind of work it around. I mean, just look how much these these side to side ball movement sequences they make the defense move around so much. And especially when you're at the top trying to fight around screens, look how much these top guys are moving. And then when on Finnessy's drive, Juwan Morgan cuts down to the the short corner, and this guy number twenty right here who's following Morgan is actually supposed to be up here on the right side. <laughs> of the top of the zone, but because this kind of bottom wing guy goes up with Finnessy, both these defenders kind of follow up to the top and Jawan Morgan just slips to open space. And you can watch Justin Smith. is going to cut up to the free throw line and bring this defender with him. So there's no help defense around here. I, I don't know if that was intentional by Smith or not. Either way, it's a nice play that generates a lot of space. Romeo Langford, a good passer is able to find Morgan and it's just a lob over the top for a layup. I mean, e easy pickings for Indiana. And again, it's just out of moving the ball against the zone, getting that, that defense in motion, 
making it move, bending it out of shape until finally some crease forms and you're able to find an opening. That is why it's frustrating when you watch a team play zone offense and they come down one pass, chuck three. Like, Grant, yeah. if you make it, okay, that's fine. And, and actually, we saw Indiana do this toward the end of the first half against Montana State. You know, they started taking some early threes. You don't get that movement. And, you know, not that you always want to, you know, take the ball down to, you know, 30 seconds, you know, you know, five seconds left in the shot clock. But you do want to be patient for exactly the reason that you just explained. Now, against a more disciplined zone defense, maybe you don't see, you know, something that wide open. But it's certainly much more likely, you know, work at a few passes, get the defense moving, and then... You know, you're more likely to have something like that open up for a real easy bucket or a better. Yeah, and Montana State three left two on the ball a lot during that game. And what I mean by that is when you know that like a skip pass, like I showed in that first clip, when two guys close out on the ball, one of them is supposed to stay on the ball and the other is supposed to retreat back to his spot. Montana State didn't really do that. They did. They they seemed like they weren't super comfortable playing the zone. It's early in the year. Um, you know, maybe it's not. I don't know what their base defense normally is, but maybe it's not a two three. But they, they left two on the ball a lot. And because of that, they had guys out of position, not where they're supposed to be. And Indiana just went to the spots where those defenders should have been, but there was no one there. And so they were able to get easy baskets. Right, next, next clip video. here. Also from the first half, another early possession. Montana State came out of this 2-3 later in the first half, which is why a lot of these clips are from early in the game. But it's the same kind of thing. You see Justin Smith cycle through here to the wing. And so you've, you're basically playing four out around Jawan Morgan. Finnessy is going to cut through. And they try to get this pick and roll for Romeo Langford and Jawan Morgan, but it's not really there. And so, again, just being patient, swinging the ball around. Smith looks for the shot. Notice how on all of these catches, you know, they're facing the basket. They're looking to shoot the ball if it's there. They're not just, you know, taking it and immediately whipping it back. They're, they're looking for options, kind of surveying the floor. And when they're there, you know, they, they take what's given to them. So they get it into the high post. Justin Smith's going to cut through the lane to the opposite side here and takes two defenders with him. Zach McRoberts is open here. Good recognition here from Frey on Montana State to, to know that McRoberts is going to be open. Tags Smith and then closes back out on McRoberts. But it sets up the drive and kick. So McRoberts goes back out to Romeo Langford, gets right into the middle of the defense, and that's when it's cooked. If you can get in between these two top guys, and in this case, it's, you know, again, Montana State's defense has shifted way to the right side of the floor. So if you can get kind of into this foul line area, and especially with this big man stationed in the short corner, that's when you can get a lot of really nice looks. And so Langford, maybe the best off the dribble player Indiana has into Justin Smith, and it's another easy layup. Yeah, and again, just really good recognition by Justin, a good cut, and making himself available when when the opportunity is there. Good stuff. Yeah. I, I I have to imagine, you know, it's like you said, you know, Romeo, those first couple possessions, just kind of feeling it out, you know, and it kind of seems like the way that he likes to approach things, and then as he starts to get more comfortable, he really starts to attack. So, and, yeah. we, and we saw that there because he draws so much attention, and he's just so slithery you know like just the, yes. the way that he moves because he moves faster than he looks because of those strides and he can just get into those little gaps and he's such a good passer too so i think that's something that we'll see a lot of this year yeah it, it almost reminds me of chris paul like what he used to do in, when he was with the clippers was like everyone knew chris paul's the best player on the floor but you know he he didn't just come out of the gate and score 10 points in the first quarter he could have and romeo langford probably could too but uh, there's value in kind of setting up your teammates and and getting the offense moving. And then towards the end of the game, you kind of have license to take over if you need to. Whereas if you just start out kind of doing doing everything yourself, it's not quite the same flow that you get on offense. Well, you, and you get here, your guys involved. I mean, you know, it's exactly. like, like, like Justin yeah. Smith is not going to create a lot of offense by himself. He creates offense with movement and cutting and vision, but he needs right. someone to set him up. And I mean, I thought he was great in the first half and that gets him going. Yeah. You know, same with a guy like Zach McRoberts, who mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily need offensive touches to get going, but that keeps him involved on that end. So I think smart players, you know, at, you know, at the level of a Romeo, you know, like Chris Paul, like he talked about, understand that they can go get theirs whenever they want to, but you got to get everybody else involved because you're going to need them for the full 40 minutes. Right. So I think it's and, and I do think there's there's an emotional component to that as well. You know, when a guy feels the ball, when he feels like he's part of the offense, you know, maybe he fights harder over a screen on defense. Maybe he cuts harder to the basket if he feels like he's going to get the ball on that cut. Yep. Maybe he, he runs hard in transition to the corner and, and fills a spot there. Rather than if he's not touching the ball, maybe he, he loafs back on defense. 
So I do think there are kind of these um, these mental emotional components to this as well. I mean, I mean, I thought I thought Juwan was a lot more engaged in the Montana yeah. State game, especially defensively, oh, than he was in the Chicago State game. And I don't know how much of that has to do with exactly what you just said, getting involved offensively, but it can't hurt, you know. So. Yeah, and, and Juwan, especially in the first half, was really, really aggressive, six yeah. for six in the first half for 14 points, and we'll see a result of that on this play here where, you know, he was so dominant in the post that by by this point in the game, and really by midway through the first half, he had Montana State's full attention every time he posted up. And so here, at, you know, again, 2-3 zone, moving the ball around the perimeter. Juwan Morgan tries to post up here on the strong side block, and watch how... You'll see the top guy here, top weak side, top part of the zone is going to sag down into the paint off of Robert Finnessy, but he can't leave this zone entirely because he's got two on his side. Meanwhile, the bottom player on the weak side comes all the way over to the strong side and doubles this Juwan Morgan post up. So he's his, he has two feet outside the paint. Wow. And so you have basically this entire lane of space and Romeo Langford quick to realize that. And they just go up top for the lob. Has and Romeo ever seen that much daylight on offense before? It's unreal. Holy I mean, especially, I mean, <laughs> this is a defensive breakdown because you have to account for Romeo Langford. You have to know that he's able to do this. But, I mean, consider the alternative, right? If he does it, let's say he he cuts through and, and this player who's kind of at the midline on the weak side, basically the only player on the weak side, if he comes down to bump Langford and and take away this cut then it's rob Finnessy wide open for three and he'd already hit a couple threes by this point in the game and so you're kind of in this lose-lose situation and it's because like i said Finnessy's hit some shots but also because if you if you single cover Juwan morgan in the post and you let him catch the ball in this position where he's really comfortable and can make plays then he's just going to go to work and, and torture defense anyway and so you devote more attention to him and then you leave basically a one on two on the weak side. And one of these two guys is going to get the ball on this play. It happened to be Langford, but it very well could have been Finnessy. And you can see Finnessy here actually pointing <laughs> yeah. to Langford saying he's wide open, throw the lob and Devonte green sees it right away up top. And uh, just a gorgeous play C- couple, one of two nice dunks from Romeo in that second half. Yeah. And great vision by Devonte and a great delivery on the pass too, which is, which is necessary there. So that was, yeah, that was a great play. And you know, again, as, as we've said, you know, a thousand times the last week, the competition is not good, but it's nice to see some, j- what's nice to see is the process. Some of the mm-hmm. fundamental movements, like just yeah. the, you know, the guys kind of getting into rhythm. This is not just individual talent and length and speed taking over. This is guys looking like they kind of know a little bit what they're doing. Right. And, and it, it it's still early. It's still uneven. Archie's talked about the chemistry of the offense, not quite being there, but you know, certainly in those clips, you see a team that seems to be functioning, you know, kind of five guys all doing the same thing, um, which, you know, early in the season is not something to take for granted. You combine that with Indiana's talent, they're going to be able to get some things done on offense. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. Like you said, it's just, do you understand the principles? Do you know what you're doing? Do you look comfortable executing what you want to do against those better teams? You know, Romeo Langford can drive by his man and get to the basket against any bad team, you know? And, and so if you see, if it's all that, if that's all they're doing, if it's just Juwan Morgan backing people down in the post, then it raises the question, how effective is that going to be against Duke or Marquette or Louisville or any number of, you know, quality conference opponents that they're going to see. But when they're moving the ball, when they're cutting, when they're finding guys, you know, playing out of the right spots on offense, that's when you start to think, okay, you know, this is a, this is actually a system that they're running. This is something that, could be effective against a team with any any degree of talent um basically and so you know they're, they're not going to win every game they're not they're not going to destroy every opponent like they did in those two uh games to open the season but you know you can see the philosophies you can see the system in place and i think that's an encouraging sign because this time last year there just wasn't really that same comfort level on either end of the floor no not at all all right well good stuff as always ben follow him on twitter at b ladner underscore correct that's it. Yep. And uh, Ben wrote the post game email for the Montana State game. Did a great job. He'll be writing some more of those this year. And I guess you know we probably shouldn't tease anything for next week because we probably want to see what happens in the Marquette and Arkansas yeah. games. Um, I think you know it, it'll be, it's nice to you know kind of go over some some big picture conceptual stuff like we did with the pack line. But as some folks mentioned in the chat mob, it's really nice being able to watch our own team. You know, watch mm-hmm. our own guys do this. So maybe we'll just wait and see what storylines pop up in Marquette and Arkansas, and then just kind of follow that for what we talk about next week works for me cool 
All righty. Coming up next, it is time for our opponent preview segment. Indiana faces Marquette on Wednesday. Josh Wilson from the Inside Out Podcast is here to teach us a little bit more about the Golden Eagles and their potential All-American guard, Marcus Howard. So stick with us here on the Assembly Call. Welcome back to Banner Monday. Each week here in our final segment, we preview Indiana's upcoming opponent for that week. Uh, so obviously this week, Indiana is facing Marquette and Arkansas. But since we have an episode of Assembly Call Radio before the Arkansas game, uh, we will wait uh, to talk about them. Probably talk about them some on the postgame show of the Marquette game, too. So let's focus here on the Marquette game. That is coming up on Wednesday. And to do that, we have Josh Wilson, a member of the Chat Mob and a host of the Inside Out podcast, here to give us some insight on the Golden Eagles. Josh, thanks for being here. I was yeah, to have thanks. You. Yeah, thanks for having me again. So I always love being a part of the show any way that I can. So we were just talking before the segment started about, and you know, we've kind of talked about this some with Mike DeCourcy and with Ben a little bit too, about how the style of play that Marquette is going to bring into Simon Scott Assembly Hall is really going to challenge Indiana. So let's start there. You know, what is this style of play, and what you know, what in particular is going to make this such a challenge for IU? Well, Marquette's you know, pretty well predicated on driving kick and it's all, you know, flown through Marcus Howard, you know, they're you know, big time point guard, you know, he dribbles, he's very ball dominant. And so he, he dribbles a lot and he tries to get into the paint and kick or he'll, he'll find a way to get his own shot. So and they, they like to get up and down the floor pretty quickly. Um, so Indiana, you know, transition both ways, offense and defense is going to have to be solid, but, you know, I think with the defense that we've seen so far, it's got to be encouraging, but that's going to be tested. Uh, early and quite often Wednesday night, so they're they're gonna have to be ready to you know get back, send you know one maybe two guys to the boards and have two or three drop uh, back in transition defense. Just to you you need to slow this team down and make them run their offense. Um, you, you don't want them to get into a flow of things. So Howard, so are most of his three pointers off the dribble, or is he getting a lot of catch and shoot opportunities? Uh, I was able to watch them Saturday, and most of the opportunities that I saw were off the dribble. He, he kind of created his own. Uh, he is able to catch and shoot. That certainly is a skill of his, but he, he just got hot Saturday. And Bethune-Cookman's actually a decent team. At least they had a decent team last year. Um, but he just got hot and he went berserk. He went 7 of 10. I know the first game he went 2 of 12. So he obviously had a rough, rough first game of the season, but he just he got hot and uh, watching him play, he almost reminds me of Carson Edwards, just how ball dominant he is and the way he finds his shots. So I think it's kind of an interesting comparison, but that's the first person that came to my mind watching him play. So it's definitely you know a matchup that Indiana fans need to focus on. And you know I've been curious. I've been trying to think of the different ways that Archie is going to deploy his defense at Howard. Who exactly is going to get the start on him, or and who's you know who's going to rotate uh, you know on and off of him throughout the game. How does he compare to, you know, for people who haven't seen him play, how does he compare to Yogi? Because they're about the same size. Yogi was right. you know, obviously ball dominant, got a lot of shots off the dribble as well. Is, yeah. is there any comparison there? It, there is, actually, now that you bring that up. You know, I guess the, the Carson Edwards, I was just trying to think of people that I'm going to see later in the year that Indiana's going to have to guard. But, yeah, I mean, he, he pounds the ball. You know, I guess if, you know, you're not a basketball player, just pound. He dribbles really hard, but he's got great control of it. Uh, and he's, you know, he's about 5'11". He's quick and he, he's got kind of a good, you, you remember how Yogi always used to drive left and do the step back yeah. um, three. That's what Marcus Howard does. Hmm. I've seen him do it on several occasions. So um, he's not quite as built as Yogi, but he moves in the same manner. And his numbers are terrifying. As a freshman, he shot 54.7% from three-point range, which was first yeah. in the country. Last year, he only shot 40.4%. And obviously this year, he's had one really good game, one really bad game. But you know, all told, he's at 40.9%. Um, yeah. So, I mean, look, he is the clear star. And it's going to be really hard for Indiana if he has one of his 30-point games or you know, he had a 50-point game before. You know, Is this as simple as make life tough on him, he has a tough shooting game, and you win the game? Or do they have enough around him that they can kind of compensate for that? Well, they, they do have good players around him. Uh, you know, the Hauser brothers, uh, Sam and is it, I believe it's Joey. Um, yeah, Joey Hauser. So they're, they're both about 6'7", six, 6'8". Six, they can shoot the ball well. Uh, the, the shooting guard's name is Sakar Anim. Um, he, he's, he's not as much 
Um, he's not very fluent from the outside. He's kind of more of their kind of their bulldog type player. Um, but they have capable shooters and they move well in sequence together. But I do think if you can make it tough on Marcus Howard, you give yourself a great chance to win the game uh, just simply because he, they go as he goes. I mean, they got good players around him, but I think if you can make life tough on him, um, you know, Indiana's going to have as good a shot as winning that game, you know, because he scored 15 points in the opener and Sam Hauser scored 15 points. But other than that, I don't think there were very many people in double digits. There's only two guys that average double digits so far in the year. He averages 26. Obviously, he had a 37 point game on Saturday, but Sam Hauser averages 12 and a half and everybody else is under 10. So I think if you can really limit him, uh, you're going to give yourself a good shot. So clearly, we understand what about Marquette is going to pose a big challenge for Indiana and their defense. Where are the the issues for Marquette that Indiana can really take advantage of? Well, uh, so far they've been turnover prone. Uh, they're averaging right around 17 or 18 turnovers a game. So I think that's got to be promising just with Indiana's defense. If they can force turnovers and get down and out um, on the floor, you know, it's going to, you know, be really good for Indiana to kind of get some blood flow and get some shots going down. Hopefully that'll help them out. Um, but Indiana is going to be much quicker than Marquette in most positions, and they're going to be a little bit longer. So I think the athleticism, the length, and the speed, all things that Archie loves and he knows he has a lot of, um, they can take advantage of that. Because Marquette, they, they do have size, but I don't think they have ath- as much as le- athletic size as Indiana does. So mm. um, pressure defense, if you can get them to turn the ball over, there's going to be a lot of opportunities for Indiana to get easy buckets, which always helps at home against a ranked opponent with a dominant point guard. Yeah, boy, they've really turned the ball over a lot. They're turning it over on 22.4% of their possessions so far. In fairness, last year, you know, because they've played, I think the two teams they've played this year, UMBC is 244th, Bethune-Cookman is 303rd. Um, Mm -hmm. So, you know, not great competition. Last year, they only turned it over 17.3% of possessions. So that was top 100. So it'll be interesting to see maybe that's a, you know, a two-game blip or maybe that's just an issue for them this season. You know, the other thing that hasn't borne itself out in the numbers so far this year, but was a big issue for them last year, is they were not good at keeping teams off the free throw line. They were 289th in the country in free throw rate, meaning they really put their opposition on the line a lot. And they also didn't defend two point field goals very well. They gave up the 304th highest two point field goal percentage. And, you know, that would seem to play right into what Indiana wants to do based on what we've seen the first couple of games and what Archie has talked about, you know, wanting to really attack the paint. Now, you might laugh and snicker and say, yeah, well, if they put us on the free throw line and we're only going to make 50 percent of our free throws. Well, you know, we're all hoping that that's still going to improve. Um, But that would seem to me like what you would want to probe early on, you know, kind of like they did against Montana State is you know, play through Juwan, especially early on, and basically challenge Marquette to prove that they're better at defending the post than they were last year because they were not good at it at all last year. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that's something Indiana's going to have to do. Is there's not, from what I saw, not, albeit it's been two games and I got to watch the one on Saturday, there's really not a lot of great depth on this team. Yeah. Uh, Theo John, I believe, is their starting center. I think the backup, if you remember Ed Morrow from Nebraska, he transferred into Marquette. So that's why that name sounds familiar. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. He, he played it. Yeah. He played it in Nebraska. Um, but there, there's just not a lot of quality depth. Uh, you know, you got the Hauser brothers and then the Theo John, Ed Morrow. And then, I mean, Sakara Neem's in the backcourt with Marcus Howard, but I just didn't see a lot of quality depth off the bench for them. So if you make them guard you and you can get, you know, <clears throat> if you can get Marcus Howard in foul trouble or one of their bigs, then you really, you take away one of their weapons. And I just, the Indiana's depth is going to come in such, you know, it's going to be a great asset this year. So I think they really have to attack. They got to get to the rim. Um, you know, I think the free throw shooting is going to come around. There's going to be a lot of excitement in the building. i Marquette's probably going to play man-to-man defense, so there should be a better better flow to the game. So I think um, you know, get to the rim, you know, test them early, see how they're going to guard you, and you know, find your matchup that you can take advantage of. Uh, you know, Marquette last year, just a couple more numbers. They were not a very good rebounding team. They were sub two hundred on both ends from a rebounding perspective, but you know, elite three point shooting wise, they were third in the country last year. So far this year, they're only you know one hundred and fifth. But again really tough to read too much into the numbers i you know i guess that that's really the other big key you know for for this weekend or for this game is how how improved are they defensively because you know i mean correct me if i'm wrong i mean i I feel like i think they're going to make some shots they're going to make some threes you know indiana's been holding opponents you know down they're not going to hold them to 55 points like marquette's going to score some points 
mm-hmm. but I think Indiana will play pretty well. I mean, they only scored sixty-seven against UMBC, so it's not like they're you know just an unstoppable offense, right? But I I kind of feel like we pose more questions for their defense than they pose for ours. I guess is the way that I look at it, and so I think that they'll get theirs and they'll make some threes. But I really feel like they're going to have a harder time dealing with everything we can do than we are dealing with the different things they can do. Right. And that's where that length and athleticism is going to come in. You know, if you make Howard and that, you know, the Hauser brothers take difficult shots, you know, they're, they're going to hit a couple. I mean, they're top level college athletes. It's going to happen. Um, but if you can challenge all of their shots and not give up wide open looks and, you know, just make life difficult, then you're going to give yourself a good chance because if you make them work on the offensive end, that's just twice the energy that they have to exert on the defensive end. And that's where depth comes into play. That's where the speed for Indiana comes into play. So you start to slowly wear them down. And I think that's going to be a factor. You, you, Indiana needs to make it a factor. Um, but you got to challenge their, challenge their shots on defense. Um, they don't, if they get open looks, they're not going to knock them down. I mean, they're good shooters. If you, if you challenge them, you're going to set yourself up really well. So do you want to, you know, we're kind of getting comfortable with this segment with how we want to do it. Do you want to offer a prediction? Right. Do you want to, you know, kind of say what you think is most likely to happen in the game on uh, Wednesday night? Yeah, like, you know, final prediction wise? Yeah, sure. Let's put you on the spot. <laughs> well, and I'm just trying to think with the offensive, you know, what what, what Indiana's going to do. Um, I, I think I'll go... St- 72 64 Hoosiers because I think just the way the defenses look for IU, um, you know, Marquette did have a good scoring game, but Marcus Howard got hot. And then Bethune Cookman, once they got down, it's just kind of a um, free for all almost. But I, I think if Indiana, if their defense shows up to play and, you know, they do kind of some of the things that we've talked about, they can hold Marquette in check. So I can see it mid 70s to high to low 60s, kind of in that, that range. I'll go 72 64 Hoosiers. What do we know about their toughness, right? Like, like, because when I've looked at this team, they've kind of reminded me of one of the old Tom Crean Indiana teams, where it's like, you know, they've got this really good point guard, they can really shoot it. Like, if things go well and they're shooting, it probably looks beautiful, and they can beat anybody on any given night. Mm-hmm. But if it doesn't, dot dot dot. And the answer for Indiana was, if we're not making the threes, we really have nothing else to fall back on, and especially on the road, we pretty much are not going to have a chance. I haven't seen them enough to know if that's a fair comparison at all, even though I've made it a couple of times. But like, is this a team that projects to be kind of mentally tough and is going to be in it for a 40-minute fight even if they can't make threes? Or is it going to be as simple as if they're not making those shots and Indiana you know, pushes them out of the first thing they want to do offensively, they're, they just have no chance? Do we know? Well, I think that's... I, I I wish I do. I was looking at the uh, the the box score of the UMBC game, and I really wish I could have watched that game because Marcus Howard took a lot of shots. And watching him Saturday, it almost seems like he's going to try to get his, regardless if he's scoring or not scoring. Um, he, it's almost like if he's missing, he's going to keep trying to find it. Um, mm. You know, until he 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 makes one, just with the way the box score looked like. So there's not. Let's see, because he's a junior. Yeah, I believe. Yeah, he's a junior. So they don't. They have a couple seniors, but um, I didn't really see them play a lot of play a lot of. Yeah, minutes. they're so they're two hundred and twenty fourth in experience, um, yeah. according to Ken Palm. So yeah, they've got him, the junior Joey Hauser is a freshman, Theo John a sophomore, Sam Hauser a junior. So I mean, they don't have anybody else who is more than a role player, according to right. Ken Palm. So a guy that uses twenty percent or more of possessions. Uh, that is an upperclassman other than Marcus Howard. So Yeah, so that's going to be the interesting thing is because, you know, the Big East is a good conference, but how many atmospheres do you walk into in its assembly hall, especially when the crowd's rocking? I mean, it, Marquette's going to be a ranked team, and you know how rank, what it's like in assembly hall and ranked teams come into play. So I'll be eager to see how they handle that. But I think if you can get under their skin, they probably get flustered a little bit because you're going to start speeding up Marcus Howard, and maybe he's going to feel a little more pressure to try to score more. And – that's always a good thing if you're the defense because then he starts losing sight of his teammates. And so you, you hope you can do that up by speeding him up. But I, yeah, put some pressure on him and I'd love to see if we can break him a little bit. All right, last question. Charles in the chat. Over under on Tom Crean mentions during the game. Alex France has set it at 7.5. Over under. Ooh. I'll go over because I wanted to call this the Tom Cream Bowl. So, <laughs> <laughs> see, I okay, I'm going to go under. It obviously would have been, you know, obviously if Tom Cream was still coaching, yeah, it would have been. But oh yeah, you know, I, I don't know. I think I, I think it'll be a big storyline early on, but then 
the style that Indiana plays is just so much different from how they were playing under Tom Crean. I think that I think yeah. the Tom Crean comparisons will fade away quickly. Yeah. Hope and so, we had but... some great wins under Tom Crean. I don't necessarily mean that as a negative, although I do enjoy Archie's style yeah. more, but I'm just saying. It's one little, one little thing different. to look for though, and I've been thinking about this all weekend, is who who gets the matchup on Marcus Howard first? Do you put Finnessy on him? Do you put Lankford or McRoberts on him? Because Lankford is quick, he's long, he's longer. Him and Finnessy are about the same size, and you know, Rob's obviously built and he's quick enough to stay with him. I'm curious to see who starts on Howard. I am too. I, I would imagine that they'll they'll start it, you know, straight up, meaning Robert mm-hmm. Finnessy plays him. In part, just because that seems like Archie's type thing. Like, we're just going to go right. play defense the way we play defense. No gimmicks here. You know, also because they have length. So you're going to kind of need Romeo and Zach's length on some of the other guys. But what I wouldn't be surprised to do would be, you know, maybe every third or fourth possession, you run Zach or Romeo at him and just give him a different look. You know, right. just to, because so, you know, any shooter, you get into a comfort zone. It just it makes life easier. And if you go down knowing what to expect, who's going to be guarding you, you know, and he's a junior. Rob is a really good defensive player so far, but there's going to be things Marcus Howard can do to take advantage of Rob's inexperience. You know, Absolutely. same thing with, you know, Devontae, you know, can tend to get a little over exuberant. Um, so I, I would play it straight up, but then just try to maybe switch up who's guarding him and give him a few different looks to keep him off balance. Um, yeah. But, you know, we'll see. Hopefully they don't need to do that because just playing it straight up works well enough. Hopefully not. But if the if he gets in rhythm, what I hate to see is when a shooter gets in rhythm and you don't try different stuff. You know, right. try some stuff, get him out of rhythm. You know, do Ben Ben mentioned really you know really hedge the you know the ball screen so he can't just dribble into those three pointers. You know, do some things to get him out of a rhythm because yep. if he if he gets in rhythm, it's it's going to make things tough. That's for sure. It could be. Yeah, you got to make him work. That's that's how you're going to win that game is make him work for everything. Yep. All right, Josh. Well, thanks for being here. Thanks for the uh, preview, man. We appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks for having me on again. I always love it. For sure. Listen to the show. Inside Out. What's the Twitter account for the podcast again? It's inside. Yeah. Inside underscore out pod. I always get the. Yeah, yeah, I get the underscore misplaced. It's inside (laughs) underscore out pod. pod. Okay. There we go. Listen to that. And uh yeah, that'll, uh, that'll do it for us on this week's edition of Banner Monday. If you want to see us do the show live and be part of the live chat, join us at assemblycall.com on Monday afternoons for the live broadcast of our Banner Monday recording. And you can always subscribe to our podcast by searching for Assembly Call wherever you listen to podcasts. And don't forget to go to assemblycall.com or text IU to 66866 to join our free email newsletter, which will make you a smarter and more well-informed IU basketball fan. Thank you for listening. We'll be back to to talk IU hoops again with you after IU Marquette Wednesday night. Until then, keep your elbows in and your eyes on the rim. And go Hoosiers. Thank you. All right, I got to get out of here, folks. Thank you. Thank you for being here and for listening to this episode of The Assembly Call. We appreciate it. And we really do rely on the support of audience members like you to keep our show going and to keep growing. And so we have set up a page on our website at assemblycall.com slash support that lists five ways that you can support The Assembly Call. And we encourage you to choose whichever method is the easiest and most convenient for you. One of the methods is donating, and so many of you have donated, and we appreciate it so much. On that page, you can choose a monthly recurring donation or an annual recurring donation or just a one-time donation, whatever works for you. And if you don't want to donate, another way to support the show is you can use our affiliate URLs, iutickets.shop or iustore.shop when you're going to shop for tickets or gear, and we will get paid a small commission when you use those links. But however you support the show... We appreciate it. Thank you.